Coming up on this episode, we've got reviews of what we've been reading recently, plus a special audiobook excerpt. Welcome to episode 403 of the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for avid readers and passionate fans of queer romance fiction. I'm Will, and with me, as always, is my co-host and husband, Jeff. Hello, Rainbow Romance Reader. It's great to have you back here for another episode of the show. As always, this podcast is brought to you in part by our remarkable community on Patreon. Thanks to Macy for recently joining the community. If you'd like more information about what we offer to patrons, go to patreon.com slash biggayfictionpodcast. So Jeff and I recently spent a couple of days binging the newest season of Young Royals. A while back, we raved about this Swedish show that is currently on Netflix. And it has made its long-awaited return. Season 2 was amazing. We absolutely loved it. All of the students of the Hillerskeller School are still coming to grips from what happened during the previous term. In this season of the show, Prince Wilhelm is still kind of trying to navigate what it means to be a crown prince while still trying to get his revenge on August for what he did. And at the same time, trying to win back his beloved Simone. I wanted August to burn so badly, I can't even tell you. That was like my whole thing for the season, like, this this guy needs to pay. I really loved how it came back. And of all the various stories that played out in these six episodes, what I really loved was the growth of Wilhelm here. In season one, he is not really wanting to be at the school, not really wanting to be around these people, not really wanting his role. And he's kind of inside of himself a lot and not very confident. He does deal with anxiety. He deals with that even more in season two. But he also gets this confidence. He starts laying down the law, not just at the school in some ways, but even with his mom, the queen. It was a really nice growth. And he did also start to work through some of his mental health issues, I thought, in a really good way. The love story little bit of a backseat this time because they have to work through some issues that they had. But boy, when Wilhelm and Simone are together, oh, they are so sweet. I love it so much. I hope there's not as big of a gap between season two and three as there was between one and two. We love this show. And if you like Young Royals as much as we do, might I suggest you watch it sooner rather than later? That way Netflix knows there's still a voracious appetite for these kinds of stories. Mm -hmm. Like you just said, here's hoping... For more in season three. So that's what we've been watching. Let's move on quickly to what we've been reading recently. Of course, it is holiday book season. And I can't wait to tell you all about what I've recently read. You're a Mean One, Matthew Prince by Timothy Janofsky. This book is so great. It is absolutely perfect for the holidays. And as you might have guessed from the title, it's about a guy named Matthew. <laughs> After impulsively buying an entire island... Matthew is exiled to his grandparents' quaint and decidedly unluxurious small town, Wind River, for the holidays, where he must share a bunk bed with a hardworking college student named Hector. Um, it's essentially hate at first sight, and they can't speak two words to each other without verbally cutting each other down to size, which is super frustrating for Matthew because Hector is so damn hot. After Matthew makes a failed midnight escape attempt via an Uber... Hector is disarmingly nice and supportive when Matthew has a panic attack. They realize that while they may not have a lot in common, at least they understand each other. And to get out of town and back into his parents' good graces, Matthew decides to throw the most memorable Christmas charity gala this town has ever seen. And Hector is going to help him. Now, his grandmother doubts his sincerity. So she devises a home baking competition to test his holly jolly commitment, let's say that, (laughs) to the very serious task of putting on this gala. The Christmas cookies he makes with Hector are judged to be sufficiently jolly. And suffice it to say, Matthew might not be great at doing everyday things, which leads to several embarrassing moments in front of Hector. But he's really in his element when it comes to negotiating with the dean of the local college for event space. And he later presents a well-thought-out but extremely over-the-top New York City theme for the party. Hector suggests that he dial it back just a little to something more within their budget. At the coffee shop in town, Noel sees how Matthew is starting to vibe with his former enemy turned partner in party planning. And since we're in the getting to know you part of the story, Matthew is in truth starting to catch feelings, liking him more and more despite the whole from different worlds thing. While they're all at the local Christmas tree farm, Noel asks out a girl she likes. 
but doesn't want it to look like a date date. And she insists that Matthew and Hector join them for a group night out at the Holiday Light Show. So after bringing the tree home, Matthew and Hector cuddle up in the lower bunk and watch their favorite holiday movie, A Muppet Christmas Carol. Matthew opens up and explains everything that led to him being there. It was a hard breakup. He was the third in a thruple, which led to him impulsively buying that stupid island. Hector is sweet and understanding, and they share a kiss, which they both wanted for a while, but realize that maybe, like, that exact moment isn't really the time or the place. However, at the storage unit where the dusty old decor from Gala's past are stored, they share some coming out stories, which, you know, of course, is a de facto first step in any queer dating scenario. And that leads to some very intense kisses, followed by some very satisfying hand jobs. That night, they join Noel and Sienna for drinks, an evening's non-date date. Everyone has a great time. And thoroughly buzzed, they walk through the cheery Christmas lights. Matthew and Hector get a picture with Santa and admit they have feelings for each other. And they seal this relationship acknowledgement with a kiss. Now at this point, gala prep is in full swing. But even in the flurry of activity, Hector still takes a moment to set up a holiday picnic to share with the big city boy that he is definitely starting to fall for. Matthew's mom makes an unexpected visit. She's cordial but frosty, as per usual. And when the big night arrives, everyone is there. And thanks to all of Matthew and Hector's hard work, it goes off without a hitch. Even Matthew's mother thinks it's a smashing success and invites him back to the city so they can celebrate the holiday like a real family, kind of like they used to. Before he can discuss this with Hector, Noel shows Matthew the headlines blowing up all of social media. Somehow, the whole world now knows about Island Gate, and nobody has anything good to say about the spoiled and frivolous Matthew Prince. Anxiety and panic overwhelm him. Hector was the only one he trusted with the details of what exactly happened. And it seems to have bitten him in the ass. Understandably, he is heartbroken and betrayed, so he packs up and he gets out of Dodge. Christmas in New York is nice, and Matthew's mom and dad are truly trying their best and are pulling out plenty of long-forgotten family traditions, but something, or maybe someone, is missing. It doesn't take long for Matthew to figure out that the holiday cheer is all a facade and that his parents have screwed him over just like they did in the past, and that Hector had nothing to do with the island story leak. He just might be the only person who's ever been open and honest with him from the get-go. On Christmas Day, Matthew comes up with a plan to take back his life. He talks things over with his parents, and while he does not forgive the unforgivable, they're at least working through things and having adult conversations about the challenges that their family faces. He returns to Wind River with belated Christmas gifts and Mia culpas for everybody, including Hector. And as per his new adult talking it through approach to life, not panicked island buying sprees, they have a very merry makeup and a very happy H-E-A. Now quickly, I want to say it may have seemed like I just spoiled the hell out of the ending, but truly, I have just given you the broadest strokes of the wonderful grand gestures Matthew makes, which are actually small and thoughtful, which makes them a million times cuter and more meaningful. Matthew grows a lot over the course of this story, and it's so wonderful to see his relationship with Hector and everyone else. It's so grounded and meaningful. And despite the title of the book and Matthew's slightly grinchy demeanor at the beginning, it's not really about his heart growing two sizes. It's really about the search for like genuine, meaningful relationships. And that's kind of the theme of the story. It's really wonderful. It's also sweet and festive. And I really recommend if anyone is looking for a festive holiday rom-com, give the latest from Timothy Janofsky a try. You tick so many boxes for me in that. The big city guy ends up in the small town. You had a gala. You had a baking competition. It's really kind of good. <laughs> If I was playing Hallmark Bingo, I would have had so many boxes. Precisely. <laughs> All right. And I've got a holiday romance, too. I do love a Roan Parish holiday story. You might have heard me talk lovingly about last year's Christmas-themed delights on Not Bridge Lane, or the recent Halloween story, The Rivals of Casper Road. As we move into the Christmas and Hanukkah season this year, Roan dishes up the holiday trap, a house swap romance that brings us happily ever afters for Greta and Truman. So here's the deal. Greta and Truman need to get out of their respective towns. Greta, who lives on an island in Maine, has a very intrusive family. They've gone so far as to set her up, despite knowing she's a lesbian, to participate in a charity auction because they are desperate for her to have a date. Any date, it doesn't really matter who. Greta loves her family, but this is the last straw. She needs a break, 
even if it means being away for Hanukkah. Truman is ready to escape New Orleans after a massive heartbreak. He arrives on his boyfriend's doorstep to deliver an early Christmas present, only to discover that he's been deceived for months. His boyfriend has a husband and a daughter that Truman knew nothing about, and of course, they knew nothing about Truman. Truman needs a complete change. A mutual friend suggests they take a month and house swap, which sends Truman to Maine and Greta to New Orleans. Truman will take care of Greta's carnivorous plants, while Greta takes care of Truman's dog. It's a perfect getaway for each of them, and it allows them to discover more about themselves and find new love, too. I absolutely adore Truman and Greta, and the journey Rowan sends them on. They are both messes when we meet them, dealing with the anger that they both have about the situations they left. Truman's also got the extra heartache of losing the man he thought might become a partner for life. The journey they go on, discovering the good things that are available to them as they break away from what was holding them back, was really delightful. In New Orleans, Greta discovers life in a larger city than the very insular life that she had. She dives into the opportunity to explore all the newness of the city and allows herself to meet all kinds of people and experience things she'd never tried before. After so much time basically living to please her family, she's branching out. She learns some key lessons about truly listening to people and not doing simply what she thinks is best or what she thinks someone truly wants and isn't telling her. Greta's romance with Karis was sweet as they learned about each other, their families, and in particular, I found it refreshing how Karis addressed setting boundaries and the importance of not downplaying what your partner actually tells you. One of the things I enjoyed most about Greta's story was how Roan made New Orleans seem like a small town. Now, of course, New Orleans isn't a ginormous city, but there was a focus on neighborhoods and people rather than making the story about a small town person in the big city. And for me, that just added to the delight of the story. For Truman in Maine, it was definitely a case of someone having to sort out being in such a small town and also going to a much colder climate. He definitely had some adjustments to make, which also included how everybody in town seemed to know who he was, sometimes simply because he wore one of Greta's sweaters and how fast news traveled through the town. Truman's romance with flower shop owner Ash is swoony good. And it includes a save the flower shop element. And I always love it when we have to, you know, save something in a story. Truman discovers how he needs to stand up for what he wants and that he is deserving of all of that. And Ash has to find that he can be loved and that a partner can be there to help him with life, both his business and family. Ash has a lot going on and Truman wants to be there for all of it and support the man he loves. There's also a super cool thing that Truman gets caught up in as he realizes one of his favorite authors has likely lived in Greta's house. That storyline adds a little bit of interesting mystery to the story. I loved both of these romances. Greta and Truman have some similar circumstances in needing to build up their own confidences, but they also had many differences, as did their romantic partners with Karas and Ash. You get two terrific romances for the price of one in The Holiday Trap. And as usual, Rome Parish creates characters that I would love to hang out with, and ones that I can't help but root for. Kudos on the audiobook, too, with narration by Natalie Duke, Pete Cross, and Hilary Huber. They bring all of the characters perfectly to life. I absolutely think that The Holiday Trap by Rome Parish should be on your holiday reading list. So can we talk about how swap romances for a minute? This was my first one. And although I've seen a few rom-com movies that use this storytelling method, in fact, I recently watched The Holiday since this particular book was kind of inspired by The Holiday, according to the author's notes, I found that in book format, this was like an odd experience for me. I mean, I totally loved Greta and Truman. They were just amazing, and I loved their stories. But this every few chapters of switching back and forth was absolutely not my favorite thing. <laughs> It's a very different thing, switching back and forth, point of view of two characters who are your central romantic heroes. But another I found to be switching up the stories completely. I mean, I didn't do a count or anything, but every three or four chapters, we were switching over to the other romance. And I really got to thinking, if I'd been reading it in ebook or paperback, I honestly think I might have read one story and then switched to the other and gone back and read the alternate chapters. Like after a certain point at the beginning when the house swap started, I might have like just split the stories. I don't know. Or maybe I wanted it more in a duology because I kept being like when the POV switched, I'd be like, oh, but but wait, not right now. 
Because, of course, it does what it's supposed to do, where there's like a little, you know, kind of cliffhanger moment at the end to kind of pull you through. And I want to be clear, this is nothing at all to do with Roan's writing style or how the book even was plotted out. This is a house swap, and of course, it's going to work this way. But it's more something I noticed in myself and how I reacted to those kind of POV pivots. I don't know. Does this mean that house swap isn't for me, necessarily? I don't know. It probably just means that reading romance has trained you to focus on one core central couple. And as you're reading this story, that's probably where your mind naturally gravitated towards. Honestly, I would probably have the exact same experience (laughs) because I'm not used to reading a narrative with larger casts of characters and several congruent Mm storylines. And I think it's reading versus watching, too, because... I don't have a problem at all with a movie like The Holiday didn't bother me at all as it switched between Cameron Diaz and Kate Winslet. Well, yeah, a movie is a totally different thing. But I don't know that I could have read that in book format doing the same thing. Anyway, I just thought I'd share this little self-realization moment as I really enjoyed this book, but really wanted the stories to be presented to me in a different way. If you have thoughts on how swap romance, I'd love to know what those are. Feel free to drop us a line (laughs) on all of our podcast channels or leave comments on the show notes page. So now let's shift from holiday romances to a historical you recently read set in 1920s Hollywood. Yes, I absolutely loved E.J. Russell's Silent Sin. And the romance between an actor who is in need of a hit film to boost his career and a young man who is on the run and ends up taking a job as a studio chauffeur. How much did I love this story? So much so that I read it once in ebook and then a few months later came back to it so I could check out the incredible audiobook performance of Greg Brudeau. The audio only reinforced what a wonderful story this is, blending some real Hollywood history with some great queer characters. Robbie Goodman left his home in Idaho following a gay bashing that he narrowly escaped while his best friend was brutally beaten and he believes arrested or worse. Robbie feels the guilt of leaving Frank behind but knows he had to leave. He's headed for Mexico, but after some odd jobs, he ends up at the gates of Citadel Motion Pictures, and in a turn of good luck, ends up with a chauffeur job and is assigned to actor Martin Brentwood. Martin is not who he seems. Martin and his business manager, Sid, swapped lives when they arrived in L.A., because that would allow them to have careers. Martin to be in pictures, and Sid to be the manager. Martin is one of many talented and closeted queer people making a living in motion pictures. He does what he must to protect his livelihood, but his standing at Citadel is threatened as his box office draw is not what it once was. From the moment Robbie picks up Martin the first time, there's a spark, albeit one that both men try to ignore and talk themselves out of. They know there's no way anything could happen between them, to the point that they're both actually scared of it. That doesn't stop the two from settling into an easy working relationship and even to a friendship as Robbie learns about Hollywood and Martin is able to look at things from the perspective of a newcomer. It doesn't take long for a mix of fictional and real events to have these two talking more and even for Robbie to end up and help Martin take care of someone who ends up in a bit of trouble. Eventually they reveal to each other that they like men. And this is one of those books where there's a lot of excellent talking as the story goes on about what each of them wants out of life, and even the ultimate reveals for them both about why Robbie ran from Idaho and Martin's actual identity. All of the talking gets to happen in a perfectly natural way, as Robbie has to accompany Martin for location shooting. Except, Robbie isn't a chauffeur. He ends up working for the director because they're making a movie about Moses Schallenberger's time on the California Trail in 1844. Since Robbie knows a lot about animals and farm life and being on the road, he's valuable to the movie. And that becomes even more true when one of the actors can't be on set. Robbie becomes the stand-in, which means he's also suddenly Martin's co-star. EJ does such an incredible job with this story. It starts with the characters of Robbie and Martin, guys from very different backgrounds who still share so much in common because of the times they live in. They've become one of my all-time favorite couples because of their talk, how they show, even in public, that they're aware of and present for each other, and how they can ground the other, not to mention the wonderful HEA that they got. Then there's the history, too. EJ deftly mixes actual history with fictional elements to create a rich, full version of Hollywood 
And that includes life at the studio and in the difficult location shoots. And the secondary characters, mm, in particular, I have to call out Dottie, who we meet as a cutter or film editor, and who by the end of the book has written the film that Martin and Robbie shoot. Dottie is a great friend to Robbie, helping him sort out the strange new town he's living in. She's also a confidant because she's queer too. Martin's friend and manager, Sid, is also amazing as he wants the best for Martin, both in business and personally. And he goes above and beyond a lot. I mentioned that HEA, so very perfect and beyond what I'd expected. These two love each other. And while they're scared about what that means, they finally embrace it because they know they don't want to live apart. And the final chapter, some 23 years from where the story started, is the bow on top of this perfect package. Silent Sin by E.J. Russell has my highest recommendation, as does the audio version with that narration from Greg Brudeau that I mentioned. The romance is swoony. The historical setting in Hollywood is perfect. I wouldn't be surprised if I read this again someday, just like I might rewatch a classic film. And make sure you stick around after we wrap up here for a special presentation of the first chapter of Silent Sin as read by Greg Boudreau. It is so good. You are not going to want to miss this. This episode's transcript has been brought to you by our community on Patreon. If you'd like to read our conversation and reviews for yourself, simply head on over to the show notes page for this episode at BigGayFictionPodcast.com. The show notes page also has links to everything that we've talked about in this episode. And if you'd like even more gay fiction recommendations, Will and I have put together Happily Ever After. It's a free ebook full of reviews and suggested romance reads. So whether you're in the mood for a contemporary or a historical, or, you know, even more holiday romance, we've got you covered. You'll get it when you sign up for the Rainbow Romance Reader Report, which is our weekly podcast newsletter. To learn more and to get that free ebook, go to biggayfictionpodcast.com slash report. All right, I think that'll do it for now. Coming up next in episode 404, authors Macy Blake and Charlie Cochet are here. They're going to be talking about their collaboration on their brand new Shifter Scoundrels series. This was such a fun conversation. They share all the details of what it was like writing together for the first time. Plus, Macy tells us about her upcoming holiday romance, the Christmas Sprites series. On behalf of Jeff and myself, we want to thank you so much for listening. And we hope that you'll join us again soon for more discussions about the kinds of stories we all love. The big gay fiction kind. Until then, keep turning those pages and keep reading. Big Gay Fiction Podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more shows you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. Original theme music by Daryl Banner. And now we are thrilled to bring you the first chapter of Silent Sin by E.J. Russell, read by Greg Boudreaux. Many thanks to E.J. for allowing us to bring this to you. This excerpt is copyright 2020 by E.J. Russell, production copyright 2021 by E.J. Russell. Chapter 1, July 28th, 1921. Robbie slid the last crate of fruit out of Mr. Sampson's truck and only wobbled a little as he handed it off to a grocer's assistant on the dusty Bakersfield Road. He took off his battered straw hat, wiped the sweat off his forehead with the side of his arm, and settled the hat back on his head. Not that it kept out much sun, it was more holes than straw by this time. Mr. Sampson, the orange grower Robbie had been helping for the last two days, strolled out of the little store, tucking a wallet into his back pocket. Robbie snatched his hat off his head again. Will there be anything else, sir? Not here. Sampson's gaze slid away from his. Don't have the cash to pay you anything now, but I might have something for you back home at the Groves. He nodded at the truck. I'll give you a lift. Robbie's empty belly sank toward his toes, but he forced a smile. He'd learned in the last six weeks that the promise of a job rarely translated into money in his pocket, even if he actually did the work. A lift with the promise of work at the end of the ride, anything that got him farther from Idaho, really, was more than he could hope for. Thank you, sir. He stumbled toward the truck cab. Hold on, you. Not up front. Sampson jerked his thumb toward the truck bed. Back there, but give us a crank first. Robbie nodded and scuffed through the dirt where a pebble worked its way through the hole in the bottom of his right boot. 
He waited for Samson to get behind the wheel and then gave the handle a practiced crank. The engine caught and the truck belched exhaust. Robbie hurried to the rear before Samson could change his mind about the lift, too. As he was about to scramble over the tailgate, he spotted half a dozen discarded, half-squashed fruits, a lemon and five oranges, almost beneath the wheels. He scrabbled them out of the dust, rolled them into the truck bed, and heaved himself in after them. The jerk when Samson put the truck in gear nearly sent Robbie over backward, but he grabbed onto one of the rough slats that bracketed the bed to save himself, driving a sliver into his thumb. He crawled forward, herding his contraband in front of him until he could sit with his back to the cab. As the truck jounced along, raising clouds of dust in its wake, Robbie gathered the precious fruit in his lap and hunched over his knees. Fingers trembling, he tore into the skin of the first orange and dropped the peel to the slats. He shoved the first section into his mouth and moaned as the tart juice hit his parched mouth and throat. Squashed or not, this is pure heaven. How wonderful that people can grow something this marvelous, let alone make a living at it. His last meal was nothing but a hazy memory, so he ate one fruit after another, even the lemon so sour it made his eyes water, as the string of discarded peels fell behind, a trail of gold dimmed by dust. After he polished off the last orange, he licked his fingers. Then he picked at the sliver in his thumb as he tried to dodge puddles of fermenting juice whenever Mr. Samson took a corner too sharply. The exhaustion of weeks of rough travel, most of it on foot, caught up with him, and he fell into a fitful doze. With a bone-rattling thump, the truck pulled to a stop. Robbie blinked, disoriented, and peered around in the glare of the setting sun. Where are we? His heart sank when he took in the sturdy buildings lining both sides of the road. A good-sized town. He tried to keep to open country whenever he could. Less chance of getting work, but easier to find a stream for a drink and a wash, or a secluded barn where he could catch enough shut-eye to go on the next day. Mr. Sampson slapped the side of the truck. End of the line, kid. Robbie scrambled to his feet and wiped his hands on his trousers, not that it did much good. His pants were as sticky as the truck bed. He hopped down onto the road and caught the tailgate when a wave of dizziness threatened to take him down for the count. Thanks for the lift. I appreciate it. Mr. Sampson tilted his cowboy hat back and scratched his forehead. No skin off my nose. You were a good worker. But turns out, now I think about it, I don't need any help on the farm. He shrugged. Sorry. I understand. Thanks anyway. He wished he hadn't fallen asleep on the ride. He had no idea where he was. Does this road lead to Mexico? Mr. Sampson hitched his dungarees up under his prosperous paunch. What do you want to go there for? Nothing you can get there that you can't get here. Where's here? He jerked his thumb over his shoulder. Hollywood? Robbie shaded his eyes with one hand and scanned the storefronts across the road. Hollywood dry goods, Hollywood haberdashers, Hollywood drugstore. I guess it is. With a touch of his hat brim, Mr. Sampson climbed into his truck. Give us another crank, will you? Robbie complied and then backed away as the truck rattled off up a side street. What the heck can I do in a place like this? Robbie doubted his years of scratching out a living on a potato farm would qualify him for work in some other grower's orange grove. There weren't any factories that he could see, and Hollywood haberdashers wouldn't hire somebody with only one set of clothes, and those almost too worn to be decent. Mexico still seemed like the best bet, but suddenly he couldn't muster the energy to take the next step or catch the next lift, or scrounge the next dime. So he shoved his hands in his empty pockets, forced his back straight, and strode down the sidewalk as though he truly had some place to go, as though he wasn't adrift, or as cast away as his namesake, Robinson Crusoe Goodman. He shook his head as he followed the route Mr. Sampson's truck had taken, away from the main street, and up a slight hill. Ma sure had some odd notions when it came to naming her sons. Eddie had been lucky. At least Pa had put his foot down over Oedipus. At the back of Mr. Sampson's orange grove, Robbie found a wooden shack worthy of his old man's farm, 
and secured with nothing but a two-by-four across its door. He slipped inside and blinked until his eyes adjusted to the gloom after the brightness of the westering sun. The dirt floor was littered with arm-long sections of metal pipe as big around as his head, and a stack of broken crates leaned against the wall like a rummy who'd never heard of the Volstead Act. Not the most comfortable flop, but better than he had any right to expect. He curled up on the floor with his back to the wall, arms wrapped across his belly, and begged sleep to take him before he cried. I'm not working with Boyd Brody again, Sid. I can't. Martin Brentwood met his own gaze in the mirror over the drink cart in his living room. God, he looked like ten miles of bad road. He tried to drown me. Sid Howard, Martin's manager, emerged from the kitchen, drying his hands on a dish towel. Come on, Marty, he was just kidding. Giving you the business, same as he does with any actor. You can't take this personal. I damn well do take it personally. He'd never try that shit with Fairbanks. Shite. Martin frowned at Sid. What? A baronet's son from Herefordshire wouldn't say shit. But I'm not a baronet's son from Herefordshire. Martin sloshed more gin into his glass. That would be you. Me? I'm only a tailor's apprentice from Flushing. Sid tossed the towel on top of the piano and pried the glass out of Martin's grip. No, that would be me, and don't forget it, even when we're alone. Even in your own head. It's easier to remember the lies if you live them full time. Sid sniffed the contents of the tumbler and made a face. Don't drink this shit, you'll go blind. I'll have you know, this gin was brewed in Bosto's finest bathtubs. Martin shuffled to the Davenport and flopped down on the cushions. But you're right. He bared his teeth. It's shite. That's more like it. Sid settled in the wingback chair across from Martin. So, I met with Jacob Schlossberg today. Better you than me, Martin muttered. I loathe the bastard and the feeling is decidedly mutual. Maybe. But the reasons for the hate are different. You hate him because he's a pontificating blowhard with delusions of grandeur and the morals of a weasel. Because, Sid raised his voice over Martin's, he's the one who controls your career. He's not the only one. Ira owns half the studio. Yeah, but Ira's the talent-facing brother. Jacob's got his sausage-like finger on the studio's financial pulse. And when it comes down to it, at Citadel Motion Pictures, money'll trump talent every time. Martin snorted. So much for art. Pictures aren't art, Marty. They're business. Big business. And if nobody pays to see a picture, it don't matter if it's as arty as the Russian crown fucking jewels. Really, Sid, Martin murmured. Your language. Sid grinned. Unlike some, I don't forget who I'm supposed to be. Sid folded his hands on his knee, and no matter how much he might be able to ape a working class stiff from Queens, if anybody in Hollywood paid attention, his hands would give him away. Taylor's apprentices didn't have the kind of practiced grace that had been drilled into Sid when he was busy getting kicked out of every prep school in England. As I said, I met with Jacob today. And... Sid's heavy brows drew together. He and Ira are split on whether they want to re-up your contract. Ira's liked you since he brought you in from Innsville and put you in a suit instead of a cowboy hat. He thinks you're the best bet the studio has to counter Valentino. But Jacob... Well, I know, I know. He hates queers. Nobody knows for sure that you're queer, Marty. Sid's scowl said, and keep it that way louder than words could. Anyway, Jacob may hate queers personally, but he depends on them too, as long as they're in their place. Martin's snort was a low-class sound, but nobody could hear him except Sid, who already knew the truth. Sid had invented Martin's backstory. Hell, Sid had lived Martin's backstory, and he'd traded it with Martin's when it became obvious which one of them could make a go of it in pictures. Right. In wardrobe, in the art department, where the public never sees. It's not the invisibility that he cares about. He covets their taste. He knows he's got none. He's a stevedore's son from the Bronx. He craves sophistication, so you'll keep delivering it. Because the only thing Jacob really hates is a threat to his profits. 
You can be as queer as Dick's bloody hat band and he wouldn't care as long as your pictures make money. But they won't make money if your fans turn away. Remember what happened to Jack Kerrigan? Kerrigan's popularity dropped because he made that arsenine comment about being too good to go to war. Not because he's queer. Exactly. But with the Hollywood press in their back pocket, the studio didn't lift a finger to save him. He'd become a liability. With all his talk about no woman measuring up to mother and his lover tucked cozily away downstairs masquerading as his secretary? You don't want to be in that position. Martin pinched his eyes closed. If it's not because they suspect I'm in the life, then what is it? The cocaine. Because I told you I'm never taking that stuff again, no matter how much the studio doctor prescribes. No, it's because of your last driver. What was his name? Homer? Vernon, actually. Right, well, they don't like that you fired him. I fired him because he was a manipulative son of a bitch who saw driving a studio car as a sure way to stardom, provided he could fuck the right people. Swive. What? Are you telling me a baronet's son wouldn't say fuck? Baronet's sons definitely do, especially when imprisoned at boarding school with dozens of other baronet's sons. But Martin Brentwood, leading man and one of Hollywood's finest gentlemen, does not. Martin leaned his head on the cushions. Jesus, Sid. Don't you ever get tired of the act? I'll keep up with the act as long as it pays the bills, and so will you. Sid crossed his legs. I met with Ira, too. He needs you back in to do retakes on that pro-prohibition picture you wrapped last week. Martin groaned. Good lord. Must we pander to the temperance unions and morality clubs even more? Wasn't it enough that I died horribly in the gutter at the end? Martin should have gotten a clue about where his career was headed when he was cast as the drunken lout instead of the fellow who heroically takes an axe to the kegs of evil whiskey. It has nothing to do with your performance. There were light flares in some of the scenes and the cutter can't fix it. Very well, I'll return tomorrow to die again. Good, they expect you at ten. Ten. Martin cracked open an eye. That's a civilized hour, but how am I supposed to get there? No chauffeur, remember? The studio still won't let me drive and you refuse to learn how. I'd take the streetcar, but no, the last time you tried that you nearly caused a riot. Sid stood up and collected his briefcase from the Ormolu side table. I'll contact the studio. They'll assign you a driver, although you may have to share. He lifted one perfectly straight eyebrow. You're not Valentino, after all. Yet. Isn't it grand that I don't want to be, then? Sid sighed. Marty, you need to think about your image. The studio will only protect you as long as you're an asset, and you'll only be an asset if, if I make Jacob enough money, if you don't make their job harder. Having a car at your disposal 24 hours a day is more of a temptation than you need right now. Martin pushed himself upright with clenched fists. What's that supposed to mean? Lay off the steak and pinochle parties with Bill Taylor and George Hopkins. Stay away from Pershing Square. The only reason Homer Vernon... Martin murmured, was a real threat was because he suspected what was really going on there. If one of those jokers decides to spill to the press, they wouldn't. Nobody who's in the life would ever give me away. We don't do that to one another. Not ever. That's what everyone says. Until the first time. If anyone suspects the truth, truth. This is Hollywood, Sid. Truth is what the fan rags print. And the studios have all of them in their back pocket, cheek by jowl with their string of crooked cops. Maybe. But you can't depend on that lasting forever. Remember Kerrigan. Sid settled his straw boater on his head. A studio driver will pick you up tomorrow by 9.30. I'll take care of it. Martin heaved himself to his feet to walk Sid to the door. Thanks, Sid. And next time, if you're going to fire your driver, at least make sure you wait until he takes you home. Yeah, yeah. Sid grabbed Martin's wrist, his dark eyes serious. I mean it, Marty. Be careful. This may be your last chance at Citadel, but if you pick the wrong man, you may not have another chance at anything. Martin opened his mouth to argue, but Sid walked out before he could gather his thoughts. He stood in the doorway as Sid strode down the sidewalk, the July sun beating down on the dusty boxwood hedges that lined the bungalow court. Damn it, 
is right. The places where it was safe to be a man who preferred men were few. New York, San Francisco, Hollywood. And even there, security was an illusion. The only thing that shielded them was the total obliviousness of most of the country. Hell, they didn't even have a word for it. In the life. A nice, nondescript phrase that could mean anything. But to the men and women who sought their partners from their own gender, its very blandness was the only thing that stood between them and ruin, scandal, imprisonment. Worse. With sodomy laws on the books in every state, the punishment for a conviction could be positively medieval. Martin shuddered, and as he wandered back to the drink cart, the streetcar bell clanged on Alvarado. I've still got some of my costumes from my vaudeville days. I could take the trolley to Pershing Square, just for a little while. If he dressed in the rough clothes of a dock worker or the cheap suit of a salesman, nobody would know him for Martin Brentwood, movie star. He leaned his forehead against the wall, excitement warring with shame in his belly. One last time? Without a driver, nobody would know. So much of being a star was in behaving like one presenting yourself like a person who would prompt people in middle America to shell out their dough for the privilege of watching you caper around on a screen for an hour or two. Hell, he'd heard United Artists was going to charge a two-dollar admission for Fairbanks' next picture. It was nuts. It was nuts. But Sid was right. It paid the bills, his and Sid's. He owed it to them both not to destroy his career, not to destroy his life. Because the sailors in Pershing Square might be thrillingly rough, but you never knew where they'd been. The last thing he needed was a case of the clap. Sid was right about that, too. Martin wandered over to his desk. He had a pile of fan mail that needed answering. He probably should do that. He had few enough fans left. He'd best keep the faithful remnants happy. With one last sorrowful glance at the gin bottle, he sat down and picked up his fountain pen.